Hey guys, this is gonna be a project video, and in this video, we're gonna make fold over knife sheaths. These knife sheaths are fantastic little sellers, so if you're looking for that small item that you can put your scrap leather to use, make items very quickly, make a lot of them, and then sell them for a pretty good price point, uh, the amount of leather that goes in these is almost insignificant, especially if it's scrap leather. Basically, all you've got in it is labor, and you can, I usually sell these for anywhere from $25 to $35 a piece with floral tooling and stuff. You could certainly sell them cheaper and make money still, but uh, depending on how much time you've got into them. The nice thing about these is they're very quick to make. People don't need really a size. They just have to carry the proper knife. And normally, this is for a case trapper, a double blade case trapper. And that's going to be the most popular knife that most people carry. Now, we do, we are going to make in the video and make four different types. One of them is going to, another one's going to be for a case trapper, but it's going to be buck stitched. So that's kind of a neat little, little item there. And then we'll make one for the big eye brand, the large single blade eye brand knife. And this one, I just did a Latigo whip lace. It's a very simple little edge braid. It's not even really a braid. It's just a lace. You just whip it through there. And that always looks really nice and it's very fast. So you don't have to price the knife sheath very high for doing that. And then we'll make one for the sod bust. There is a pattern pack for this video and it will contain the patterns that I used in the video and the the cut pattern on all my knife sheets is, is the same. If you get a really oddball knife, like a big buck knife or something like that, this pattern may not fit, but this pattern will fit the majority of pocket knives that you will come into contact with with people requesting you to make them a knife sheet. The only thing different that I do on my pattern is I've got this tooling window here. This is the tooling window is actually what sizes this pattern to fit a particular knife. So like this one here is for a sod buster or the small eye brand. And so it'll, it'll fit that type of knife, which is pretty popular. Then this one here is just for your case trapper. This is the one you'll use predominantly. Um, if I was gonna make a couple of dozen of these or something to have on, on in stock for Christmas gifts or stocking stuffers, this would be the pattern that I would use, would be one for the case trapper. It's gonna fit more knives. It doesn't really have to be a case. It could be a K bar or a more maker or anything like that. But that style of pocket knife is very, very popular. So that's one I would go with. Then we've also got a pattern for the eye brand, the big single single blade eye brand, like the whip laced one that we showed you. And so with these, between these three different patterns, you can make a knife sheath for just about any pocket knife that a guy's gonna carry. If you're interested in the pattern pack, you'll see in the video how I use these patterns. There is a digital pattern pack available. Remember, these are digital. We don't mail these out to you. If you wanna purchase them, you can grab the file, put, or go ahead and purchase the file, download it and print it on your own printer. I'll have the measurements on there to make sure that you print it out to the correct size because on this one in particular, if your printer settings adjust it or scale it down or up, it's gonna affect the way the knife fits in there. So we'll put some measurements on there so you can check when it prints to make sure it's printing out the right size. In the pattern pack, there's gonna be six different tooling patterns for each tooling window. So for each knife scabbard, you'll have six different floral patterns to choose from. And then from there, you can kind of make a lot of different, you can paint them different, you can tool them differently. There'll be, but there'll be six different floral patterns for each different tooling window. And so that'll be 18 patterns total for across all of these. And you can probably modify a bunch of them to go with, uh, with any of the other ones as well. Uh, what another thing that's popular on there is just a plain one with a brand on there or something like that. That's always real popular initials or something like that. But let's get started. I'm going to show you how to make these knife sheets. It's going to be a very quick video. It doesn't take a lot to make these. And again, if you don't have a sewing machine, you can definitely hand sew these. That's not a long distance to hand sew. That's not a problem at all. You can also buck stitch them. Now, if you'll notice on this little knife sheath here, that one buck stitch, I've got a double. You can take the time to lay this out to where you don't end up with two of them side by side on the bottom. Um, when I was doing this video, I thought I had it laid out correctly and I didn't end it up with two of them. I usually don't worry about it. I've sold them many of them that way. Most customers won't notice. But yes, that is uh, properly, that shouldn't be, have two buck stitch right by each other like that, but that's just the way it ended. So I would try to lay it out to where your last buck stitch is down so that you can tie it back. But you'll see in the video kind of how that went together. You can also edge braid these if you have a particular braid like the double diamond braid, I have done that here. You can also do, I think it's the Spanish uh, two knot or something like that, the real common edge, edge lace here. You could certainly do that. You can close these up however you'd like to. There's tons of different ways to, to make these, but the pattern is what's important here. And the way that I've created the pattern so that everything is easy to pattern up so you don't really need a person's knife to make these sheaths. If a person calls and says, I want a knife scabbard, I've got a double blade case trapper, you don't need the knife. All you can, all you gotta do is pattern it, uh, use the pattern and it'll fit, guaranteed. So, um, but let's get started. I'm gonna show you how to make those right quick. 
All right, so here's our pattern. I go ahead and cut it out of leather, and because I make so many of these, the paper just falls apart. So I would suggest cutting it out of a piece of scrap leather, and that way it'll hold up for forever, basically. Um, I'm cutting this out of a piece of 9, 10 ounce Herman Oak. Uh, you can use a 7, 8. It actually, they, they make a little bit nicer build whenever you use 7, 8, something a little bit lighter. But I've usually just got a lot of 910 laying around, so that's my choice. So most of the time, that's what I've got to work with. So 910, they make a really nice sheath. Now these here, I'm punching a big hole there. It doesn't matter what size, probably a number 10 or a number 11. Just something right there to get that little area there where you don't have to try to cut it out with a knife. If you punch those holes, then you can cut out from those holes, and that little area right there will be nice and smooth. Now I'm just using my little X-Acto knife blade there just to cut out the, the actual line and cut the excess off. Again, if you've got a clicker or you've got access to a clicker, having a die made, and you're more than welcome to make a die of that pattern so that you can just borrow a clicker or go somewhere and click out just a whole box full of those things because they really aren't, they're not hard to cut out by hand, but it's just kind of time consuming. And it's much easier if you'll just take all your scrap to a clicker and then click out just a whole pile of them things. Now here, as you can see, I've got my tooling window on here. You're going to have to, when you make a tap off, and that's what this is, just a tap off, take one and you're gonna sacrifice it for the tap off and put that tooling window, but you wanna put it the opposite way so that when you face the tap off down, you're making a right-handed one versus a left-handed one. So you can kinda get, get you have to make one for left hand and one for right hand if you're gonna use a tap off. You can actually create a tap off as well with a complete floor pattern on there if you want so that you can just tap off the entire floral cut lines but you can see there how it transferred that line for the tooling window and it's in the right spot it's perfectly centered it's exactly where it needs to be and uh, it saves you a lot of time so you could definitely just use a piece of mylar or a piece of tracing film and transfer that window on there but i would suggest making a reverse copy on a piece of leather as a tap off and just simply draw the line on there in reverse on the pattern and then carve that line in so that when you face it down onto the piece you're actually working on, it will put the tooling window on the correct side for right-handed or left-handed, and then you can fill that window with whatever tooling you want, basket stamp or whatever. Here, we're gonna go ahead and do a floral, and I'm just sketching something up. This one will be in the pattern pack uh, version of this. But you can also just take that line. That is not your stitch line. Remember that tooling window line is not your stitch line. That is the tooling line that's where your tooling is going to bump to so you can also take and just border stamp that with a shell and then you've got a guide there to sew beside as you'll see in a minute and you can put a brand in there or whatever and leave them pretty plain if you're going to sew them if you're going to make some that are just completely plain without a border without any, anything like that you're going to have to lightly transfer that tooling window on there somehow and then come off of that outer line to figure out where your sewing is going to be so i would almost suggest even if you want to do some plain ones at least put a double bead border line or something so that you don't have to fiddle with all that you've just automatically when you put them together you've got something to follow with your machine or with your braiding or buck stitching or whatever you're going to do you that'll all make more sense here in a minute when we go to put these together but we're going to show you a little bit of the tooling here not all of it and we've, we've tooled four of them and I did two that were geometric and two that were floral. So you can see a little bit of that here and then we'll get to putting these together.
Okay, so we've got all four of them tooled. And so the next step that we're gonna do is just go through and you wanna sand just the very top edge where the belt loop is, where that piece is coming up, and the very top edge. You don't have to worry about the outer sides or anything, so we're gonna trim all that off. So we're just gonna sand those areas up a little bit, straighten them up, make them pretty. If you're clicking these out, you don't even really have to do any of that. You can just edge them and slick them. Um, because the clicker is gonna make a nice clean cut there. But when you cut them out by hand, you get a little jagged there. And so I like to sand them so they're smooth. And I'm just coming in here with a number three edger. If you're doing seven, eight ounce, you may wanna use a number two. You can be the judge of that, but that's the size edger I'm using there is a number three. And we're gonna go and edge again, just the top. That's the only thing you've really gotta focus on. We're gonna edge, slick and dye the top edge there on all of these scabbards and that way they're ready to be put together. The rest of it, like I said, we're gonna trim and edge and slick later. All right, and here I've slicked all these. I do have video on how we slick edges and stuff. And we're just trying to make this video as short as possible. So I didn't show the whole process, but there's a link right there if you wanna go to uh, that video and watch how we slick, but that's just glycerin, saddle soap, and water. And so now our edges have had time to dry. And so I'm gonna go in there with some dark brown dye. It's just pro dye from Fibings. And we'll put that on our edges and go ahead and dye this. You don't have to dye them if you don't want to dye edges. They look great without dyed edges. I just have gotten to where I dye edges on everything. And so you're gonna to want to do this now before you fold that belt loop over and rivet it. So if you're gonna dye edges, go ahead and do that now. This is also the time if you're gonna do any kind of painting, dyeing, two-toning, or antiquing, you're gonna to want to do that at this stage here, preferably before you edge and slick that top edge, you're gonna to wanna to go ahead and do all that before the next step. Um, it makes it much more difficult. And so I suggest doing all your finish work before you start assembling these. So the first step in assembly is gonna be folding over that belt loop. And so you're just gonna fold it straight back and you wanna be sure you have a little bit of space there at the top. Don't fold it to where it pulls that top end out. And then you're gonna just wanna make sure it's straight perpendicular with your top edge. And then we're just gonna punch a number five hole at the bottom. You can certainly use double cap speed rivets here if you'd prefer, but I have had those fail and it's almost impossible when a customer brings that in with that rivet that has come out and now the scabbard belt loop doesn't stay fastened down, it's almost impossible to get a new rivet in there. So I go ahead and just use a copper rivet. Number nine copper rivet's what I use and it'll never come out and it doesn't scratch the knife or anything like that. It's, it's absolutely fine. So that's what I prefer to use. You could sew them. If you wanted to sew them in place, you could certainly do that as well. But we'll get all these belt loops riveted down and these will be ready to glue together. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and fold these and that's kind of how they're, they're gonna fold and you're just gonna line up that outer edge. But what happens on this 910, it's a little thick right there in that bend where it folds. So when I do it out of 910, I go ahead and get that wet right there in that fold area and just skive out just a little bit. You don't wanna take so much off that it makes it too thin when you go to fold that over, but we want that to be able to fold over and actually mash down completely and, and be tight when we glue it together. And so if you're using nine uh, or seven, eight ounce leather or something a little bit lighter, they tend to fold a lot easier and you don't have to even take time to do this step here as far as um, skiving that out. But we're going to get all these ready and then we'll start gluing them.
Okay, so now we're gonna take some contact cement and we're gonna go ahead and glue these. Now you're gonna to wanna to watch where your tooling is not. That's where your glue's gonna go. So basically everywhere that you didn't tool, you're gonna to go ahead and put glue there. Remember the tooling on these is the pattern for the size of the knife that you're making. So it makes it really easy. So you just put glue everywhere that you didn't tool or wherever your border is or whatever's going on there, that's where your glue will be. So if you're making multiple ones of these and you've got a bunch of different sizes like that one there's for the single blade eye brand, you're not gonna have as big a swath of glue around the edge. So you're just gonna wanna kinda look at your tooling window and glue accordingly. And then we'll glue these up, we'll let it dry, and then we'll come in there. You can see there how much more glue the one on the right has compared to the one on the left. And now we'll let that glue dry. And that glue has had time to get tacky, so we're gonna go ahead and do another coat. I suggest two coats on these, um, especially if you're using 910. It's just a little bit heavy, and we wanna be sure that they're glued down well, especially the ones you're going to braid. If you're gonna braid these or buck stitch these, you wanna be sure that you have good contact with that glue so that the edges stay glued together well. Now, this glue has had time to dry. They're very tacky, so we're gonna go ahead and fold them. When you fold them over, because of the pattern just line up the edge line the top and the outer edge and then squeeze them together and they they'll be fine but you want to line all that up just dead on straight and that'll keep everything square and everything where you where you want it and then we're going to go ahead and hammer that down and make sure that those edges get glued together really well Now this one here is for the sod buster and it's a little short and I didn't skive quite as much as I needed to. So if you have a bin there where it won't really crimp down real good, you can definitely put a little bit of water on there and that'll soften that area and that way you can pound it down with a hammer and get it glued down really well. You might wanna do that depending on the leather that you're using. If you're using Herman Oak, you shouldn't have as much of a problem, but sometimes that little bin right there can crack. And so you might wanna just get them all wet in that bend. And now we're gonna go ahead and figure out where our stitch line is gonna be. Now this particular pattern here does not have a border, like a hard border. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a bunch of little marks about where I want my stitching. And I usually want my stitch line to be about 3 16 of an inch to a quarter of an inch from the uh, edge of the tooling window. So on this particular pattern, there is no hard border. So we're just kind of making little marks there roughly about that far and then we'll draw in with a pencil. We'll draw in the line that I need to stitch on. You could probably eyeball it as you're sewing, but I just feel a little bit safer just going ahead and it take me five seconds just to sketch in a little stitch line that I can follow. You could definitely groove this if you wanted to groove it. I usually don't on knife sheets just to, I don't know, keep the price down a little bit and not take the time to do it. The Cobra Class 4 especially, it pulls those stitches so tight, there's really no sense in wasting time on something like this to groove it. But if you do, it looks really, really nice. But, um, but I usually don't. So if you'll notice on that one with the basket stamp, I did not draw a stitch line. I'm about to show you why right here on the sewing machine. If you'll pick you out a point, on my machine, I've got the left presser foot on there the left toe presser foot. And so I'm basically gonna let that foot ride on the inside of our border line. And then you can use that border line as your guide. The other one, I don't have that border line like we just mentioned. And so I don't really have something definite to follow. Right here, I can set that foot inside there on top of those shells and I can follow and it gives that stitch the proper spacing outside of that borderline like I want. Depending on what your presser foot looks like and the machine that you're sewing on, pick you a point out to where every time you sit down to sew those, you know on that point of your presser foot, whether it's the inner foot, the outer foot, the out of the outer foot, whatever it is, that you let that ride your borderline and your stitches will always be even and the scabbard will look correct. 
but the tooling window is what we're following so if there's a line there you can just follow that so you can see there how even that line is from the outside of that border and so now on this one we've drawn a stitch line so we'll just follow that stitch line simple as that and if you're going to do one of these with just a brand on it no border no shell no nothing just somebody's brand in the middle of it you'll want to use the pattern come out three sixteenths of an inch outside of the tooling window to a quarter inch and draw you a line like that one so that you can follow that stitch line and it'll still be sized correctly and all that just remember the tooling window is not your stitch line that is where the tooling goes, so your stitch line will be outside of that. Okay, so these we're just going to cut these stitches off clean and trim these and they'll be ready to go. The other two we're going to do the braid on. One of them we're going to do a whip lace and one we're going to do a buck stitch. So we'll get to those in just a second. Now what I'm gonna do here, my other machine, the presser foot actually left marks on the outside, which were perfect trim lines. The new machine that I'm sewing on the Cobra, it doesn't do that, and so it doesn't leave any marks, which is a great thing. But I also don't have a guide to know where to trim these out to. So what I'm gonna do is come another 3 16 or quarter of an inch outside of my stitch line now with a set of calipers and just draw a line that I can follow with my blade so that I can trim that excess off. So you can see how much excess we're trimming off of both of these and that should tell you how big a knife you can actually make with these patterns. Like we're, we're trimming off quite a bit so we still had a lot of room there if we wanted to make it for a, a certain pocket knife that was a lot longer than a case trapper you've still got plenty of room. So these are really neat patterns. Um, it makes making knife sheets really easy and uh, not as cumbersome as they used to be when I was having to form every one of them. Now you're gonna to wanna to be real careful when you're trimming, be sure your knife is sharp, you're cutting uh, pretty thick layers of leather there, but just one easy trim around. You can cut these however you would like. Um, I prefer cutting them the way I'm doing them now. I've got a little bit more control, but you're gonna cut around there and just try to stay as clean as possible. The cleaner you cut that with your knife and the straighter you cut it, the less sanding you're gonna to have to do. Now these I've already sanded, edged, and slicked. I forgot to film that part, but we'll show you on the next part exactly how I do that on the other two. We're about to do those here in just a second. But um, like I said, we've also got a video on how to edge and slick the, your edges, so you can certainly go back and watch that video. Now these here we're gonna braid. Like I said, this one I'm gonna do a whip lace. So I've got a number five squeeze punch and I'm basically just putting a little outline of the hole size so that I know how wide to make the border. The border is gonna be much wider because I'm gonna go ahead and use a, um, I think it's three, it's a little over a quarter inch lace. It's not quite three eighths. Um, and that's what we're gonna use for the edge braid. And so I'm gonna set my calipers to where I've got a little bit on each side of that hole punch, the size hole punch I'm gonna use, and that'll become my borderline. And we'll trim that, edge it, sand it, edge it, slick it, and dye it, and get it all ready to go before we do any edge braiding. So whether you're buck stitching, or doing an edge braid, or anything else, you're gonna wanna finish this completely and do that last. So again, we'll trim this, and then get those ready, ready to go.
So on that one right there, the glue kind of popped up right there in that bend, and that'll happen sometimes. But if you're braiding the edge or doing an edge lace, you want to be sure that's glued down. So we're going to go ahead and beat it down a little bit with a hammer and make sure that that's stuck really, really well. We don't want that opening up later as the knife scabbard gets older. And then we're just going to sand this and edge it. Now I'm edging this with a number four edger. I like to get a really nice rounded edge. So the thicker the leather you're using, the, the bigger edger you're gonna use. Uh, this is two pieces of 910, obviously folded in half. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and edge that with a number four. You probably could get by with a number five, but number four felt right on that one. So that's what I used. So we'll add that one to the pile, that one's edged and slicked, and we just gotta let those edges dry before we dye them. And now we'll get this other one ready. Now this one we're gonna buck stitch. So I'm gonna go ahead and figure out my border. My border on buck, anything I buck stitch, the border is gonna be just a bit bigger than what it would be if I was gonna sew it. So you can just kind of leave yourself enough room where your buck stitch will have border on each side of it. And we'll hammer that down real good, and we're gonna go ahead and sand, edge, and slick this as well, and get that ready for dye. All the edges have dried on these and so now we'll go ahead and add brown dark brown pro dye to the edges you want to be sure your edges are dry whenever you anytime you're dyeing your edges if they're wet that dye doesn't soak in very good and it's more chance of getting where you don't want it so we'll go ahead and put edge down that on all of these and get them ready to go Now I'm going to go ahead and do the buck stitch one first, and I'm going to run a line down the center of our border. So wherever that falls in, we're just going to run a line, and then we're going to use our chisels to make our, our holes in there. Now when it comes to buck stitching these, it can be a little bit difficult because you've got that belt loop on the back so they don't wanna lay very flat. And so what I've found that works best is just put a nice square piece of leather there on top of your tooling rock and then bring it to the edge. And then you can just very gently try to punch your holes along that edge there. And like I said, it can be a little cumbersome as far as buck stitch goes. If you've got a better way, obviously, I don't do a lot of these buck stitched, so th this way works best for me. But if you have a better, better system, then obviously try that. But we're just going to line these up and run all our holes around there so we can get to lacing them.
All right, so I went ahead and put oil on this because I'm buck stitching with white kangaroo lace and so I didn't want the oil to change the color of that lace. Um, I don't think it would have bothered it, but I felt like it was safer just to go ahead and oil it right quick before we buck stitch it. And so now we'll go through. I don't use buck stitch needles when I buck stitch, especially with that nice kangaroo lace. And I get that from Springfield Leather Company there in Missouri. So if you're looking for a good supply source for kangaroo lace, they're probably the best that I've found. They've got a lot of different colors and uh, it's a good, good product. But I don't use the buck stitch needles. I just point my lace. So I just cut it in a long tapered point and then I use my stitch all to kind of make the hole a little bit bigger and then it'll feed right through there. It saves me a lot of time. You don't fight the needles. You're not having to try to get them on there. And then when you go to pull it through there, the needle comes off of the lace and it's just a big pain in the butt. So I don't use them at all anytime I buck stitch. I just do that right there. So we'll run down all the way down here. And as you'll see here in just a second, like we mentioned in the intro that this one, I thought I had it laid out correctly and I ended up adding that one last hole with the awl so that it was right up to the edge. And I probably shouldn't have done that because then I ended, I ended at the top. And when you end at the top like that, you have no other choice but to go right back down in the hole behind you. And that closes it off, but it does make it look funny. But like I said, this is when we used to make hundreds of these for the store um, the guys would just not pay attention sometimes and they did we'd get some like that i'd get some like that and we just eh, put them out there and most customers don't care sometimes you can pull that back around and put like a little bleed knot on there somehow and just make it look cool but it's a knife scabbard people are usually pretty pretty easy with those but the way i tie it off you just go to the, the the stitch right behind it and run it through since we've got two there i'm gonna go ahead and put one right there and then we'll clip it off flush. I leave just a little bit hanging out just so that it doesn't pop back out as easy. And then we'll do the same with this side. Now we're going to point this, this lace here because it wasn't uh, pointed and it'll make it a lot easier to feed through there. Once you feed it through, clip it off, then we'll pound them down. When you pound any kind of buck stitching down, that kind of locks all those laces in place. And so it won't come undone or unraveled. So And that's our buck stitch one. That went pretty quick. Now this is a number five hole like we used when we were sizing our border here. But this is the one we're gonna whip lace. And so I'm gonna go ahead and punch all my holes. I'm eyeballing these. The, the actual rule of thumb when you're doing any kind of holes for lacing or braiding is gonna be whatever your lace is, is how wide you're going to want to put your holes apart. So from center hole to center hole should be the same width roughly as the width of your lace. Um, here I've done this braid on so many of those I just kind of eyeball it and leave a certain amount of space in between the, the deal. But you, if you were going to use say a number three hole and quarter inch lace you would space your holes accordingly. This lace here is closer to three eighths of an inch. Uh, so it's a nice wide lace. It's, it's going to fill that edge really nicely and it's going to be quick because it's just a whip lace. And so we're going to run a little bit of soap on that lace. That'll help it help it feed through the leather much easier. And that's just five being saddle soap. I prefer the white. You can use the yellow, but I feel like the white is just more of a more of a multifunction type soap. So that's what I use to get here at the end. I'm going to go ahead and square that off and show you how to start this whip lace. Whip lacing is very easy, but what we're going to do is we're just going to put a little slit in there, just like you would for like a blood knot. And we're going to put that right there in the end. And then we'll pull that down so that that hole is right over the second hole that we're about to come down through. And what that'll do is it'll tie off your starting point of your lace so that it's not gonna ever come undone. Because the top edge of that knife scabbard is what's gonna get most of the abuse because there's gonna be a knife going in and out of it. You're gonna be bumping it on stuff. It's at the top of your belt. And so I want that tied off really well so that it doesn't come loose. 
and then we'll just keep going around you're just going to go out the front and then back around and down through the back and then out the front back around down through the back it's just over and over all the way around till you get to the end And I cut this lace absolutely perfect, if not just a little bit too short for this project. <laughs> so but what we're going to do is go ahead and lift the last knot, the last braid that we did, and we're going to feed that through. I actually, once I got everything kind of snubbed down, that looks like it's almost too short. But once I got everything snubbed down nice and tight along that back that end point, I was actually able to go one more. And so I, I ran it up underneath the... Uh, the second uh, joint back and that way it was actually under two of those laces and I felt a little more comfortable with that but that's how you end them And that's all braided and so now we'll go ahead and pound those laces down anytime you braid just about anything uh, it's a good idea to just tap it with a hammer and get everything kind of uniform and mash down and locked in place and that'll help that braid from loosening up or maybe backing out or anything like that plus it helps to unify your your braiding or your lacing whatever you're doing it's just going to even things up if you've got one that's a little little off or a little crooked or something like that it'll just make them all look a lot more uniform And so all of these are done and so now all that these need is some oil if you've done uh, painting and dye work and antique you would be done at this stage because you had already done all this these i'm just going to do oil anytime i'm just going to oil them i just do it at the end it just makes them look a little better you get to oil that belt loop and stuff as well and so we're going to go ahead and do that i'm just using olive oil as i use on everything else and we're going to put two or three good coats on there i'm not oiling the buck stitch one again like i said i was worried kind of that maybe that oil would do something to that lace i don't know that it would but i wasn't going to take a chance and so i gave that oil probably an hour or so to dry and soak in and even out and so now i'm just going over it with tan coat that's my preferred sealer i use it on everything and it makes that braided edge look really really nice as well and so we're going to go ahead and put a nice coat of that on there and that will uh, seal them up make them shine and make them pretty and these things will be done All right, guys, so that's it. That's making the fold over knife sheaths. Like I said, it'd be a, a very quick project video. It's a very quick project to make. Usually what I recommend is cutting these out, you know, cut out a dozen of them. If you've got a clicker, uh, it's, it's a great idea to go ahead and have a die made and that way you can cut out a bunch of these and just have them laying around. And then anytime you need one, you can just grab it. It's also a very good uh, upsell item. If you're building a belt for somebody, you can mention to them, hey, would you, you want to match a knife sheath to go with that. They may not always wear it, but a lot of people say, yeah, go ahead. How much is this? 30 bucks or 25 bucks, whatever you're going to charge for it. And most of the time they'll do it. And then that's just a little bit extra and you're already tooling the belt. It's not much more to go ahead and make one of these, but they're great little items. 
remember when you're making these if you are going to dye or antique or anything or paint or anything like that on these be sure and do that while they're flat before you before you fold this uh, belt loop over and rivet before you sew them do do all of that work before and that way when you put them together all you've got to do is do your edge um, these we didn't do any kind of paint work or, or antiquing all i did was did, just did a medium oil on them and put them together if you're just doing that you can certainly do them when they're put together like i did these but again if you're looking for that little item that you can sell as uh, stocking stuffers or maybe you just want to make some for friends and family and gifts and stuff like that they're they're perfect for that remember there is a pattern pack if you would like that the link's down in the description just click that link and you can go there and purchase that pattern pack again it comes with six tooling patterns for each different window and then those you can probably go ahead and scale them up or down to fit if you have one of the other one and you want it to fit a certain tooling window you can certainly do that but remember our pattern packs are digital downloads. We do not print them out and mail them to you. So once you purchase it, you've got instant access to that and you can go ahead and print that out on your own printer and check those measurements that I put on there just to make sure that your printer isn't scaling them up or down. If you haven't already, be sure and sign up for the Leathercraft newsletter. We've got a, a kind of a cool little announcement here coming pretty soon and you're gonna wanna hear about that. Also, we really appreciate everybody that's been uh, giving us a lot of feedback on the Monday morning briefing videos. We've been having a lot of fun with those and uh, just kind of, I kind of get excited on Sunday to make that video. And so it's just to give you a little rundown of what's going on in the shop. If you hadn't seen that, you might want to check that one out. And uh, we've got other stuff coming along too. So be sure and subscribe to the channel, subscribe to the Leathercraft newsletter, and we'll see you in the next project video.